a lot of us coming from that builder background, that engineering background, especially having been in, in larger, more established companies, you're not thinking about the go-to-market. Um, and that's, a, you know, that's, that's definitely been a, a, you know, a, a steep learning curve. Are you running separate ClickHouse instances for each one of your customers? Or are you running ClickHouse sort of multi-tenant? I don't know how ClickHouse works uh, on that aspect. So we're doing multi-tenant. So ClickHouse is, is designed as a, as a single tenancy, but we're kind of giving each customer their own database and then using the access control policies inside of ClickHouse to ensure that, you know, customer A only ever sees customer A's data and that's it. And so we've turned it in, we've, we've made it multi-tenant we built all the security and, and sort of the safeguards to ensure it's multi-tenant. But we've also evolved now. So originally it was like, hey, we're going to have this serverless multi-tenant thing that um, you know, we'll run this giant cluster and, and maintain it and ensure the performance and everything else like that. But we're now starting to evolve to where, yes, you still have the serverless, but a customer can come to us and say, hey, I want to have single tenancy. I want to have my own virtual instance run that for me, give me all the same things that Propel has, but then now separate that from you know, the, the multi-tenant solution. So I've got a little more control over performance and don't have noisy neighbor problems and, or potentially have noisy neighbor problems and, and stuff like that. In 10 years, do you think we'll have more or fewer software engineers? Hey folks, this is Alex. Today's episode is with Tyler Wells. Tyler is the CTO and co-founder at Propel, and I thought it had a really interesting backstory, right? He was at, at Skype, early Skype. He worked for Microsoft after Microsoft acquired Skype. He was early at Twilio, you know, when there were 200 people went, was there as they, as they went public and grew and, and stayed there seven or eight years. And then started Propel based on some, some problems, some challenges he saw at Twilio and, and at previous places. So I thought that was really interesting to talk about this sort of data platform they're, they're doing to give customer-facing analytics to their users. It's really interesting to think about scaling and multi-tenancy and, and building on top of AWS, building an infrastructure service and how you think about charging and, and pricing and, and fairness and all those sorts of things. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you have any questions, comments, other guests you want on, feel free to reach out to me or to Sean. And with that, let's get to the show. Tyler, welcome to the show. Alex, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So you are the CTO and co-founder at Propel, which is a, a interesting, unique data company that I'm sure I would would have liked to have used at a few different companies in the past. Um, can you just give people a little bit on, on your background and, and what Propel is? Sure, I'll start with my background. Um, so like you said, I'm Tyler Wells. And uh, prior to starting Propel, which we started in February of 21, I spent seven and a half years at Twilio. Uh, joined Twilio in 2013 as a technical lead and left Twilio in 21 as a senior director of engineering. Um, did a couple of different things when I was there, uh, started the entire video organization. So when I joined Twilio, there was only SMS and, um, voice, uh, obviously needed to round that out by adding real time video. And so I joined, uh, them to, to, to start that organization and build that up. Um, ended up also opening an office in Mountain View for them. Um, also opening an office in, in Spain, uh, spent a lot of time obviously building out all of the infrastructure for video plus the front end clients. All of that was based on on WebRTC. Um, that also was sort of like a, a pretty fun journey in terms of data that we got to embark on there. Uh, obviously with WebRTC and having a global client base, we collected a lot of data, needed a lot of that data to troubleshoot, um, ended up using a lot of that data to basically answer questions about when a call center maybe was having a bad day or things were going wrong there. And that ended up turning into a product, one of our first data products that we shipped at Twilio um, and was a lot of, I would say, sort of the initial impetus for why we started Propel. Um, but we'll more on that later. Um, st spent like six plus years doing the whole uh, you know video thing and then left to start the SRE organization. Um, that was sort of like my, my, my final piece there. Started that organization from scratch, built it up. Uh, really got involved with reliability across the in entire company there. Enjoyed that a lot and left to to go start uh, Propel where I'm at today. Yeah, very cool. Just to, just to give people an idea, when did, I guess, when did Twilio start? When did it go public? Like, where are you sort of in that timeline there? Yeah, so I, I came on a few years. I think Twilio started, I want to say like 2008-ish, 2009-ish. I don't remember um, exactly. It was before my time. Uh, went public in 2016. 
So I was there a good three years uh, before we went public. So I got to see all of that. I got to see our growth. Like I joined, I was employee like 187, I think I was. Wow. And yeah. by the time I left, we were five or 6,000 employees. It was, it was a crazy, like, you know, a rise. It was just nuts all the, to the people where we went from. Oh yeah. Some true changes I'm sure you saw there. Oh, huge. Um, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that stayed true to form. Um, it was always a small team culture and, and we tried to continue to embrace that, but things have to evolve and change when you become larger and larger and you've got more surface area that you have to cover because of the the products and everything else like that. But is there a change like around the, the going public time specifically, either like right before that in preparation for it or right around that time? Or is it just more gradual as you get bigger? It's, it's just sort of always changing in, in the public private distinction isn't isn't like sort of a, a true marker in, in any way i mean the public private distinction largely what i saw as is, is, is more more formal trainings that you had to take um <laughs> you know at the end of the day um you know we're, we're building for our customers right and customers always remain number one and that was the first and our goal was first and foremost to delight our customers and so a lot of those values those core values did not change over time they evolved we refined them but at the end of the day, we had to develop. We had developers we had to serve, and so even through the whole course of going public, that was always the core focus, right? Even the day that we went public, it was like you know this is day one or day zero, whatever that whatever the saying was. Uh, we'd gone public, and it was like nothing changes. Like keep going, keep doing the exact same thing, keep delighting your customers. Um, the only thing I would say, like I said, that that changed was a little more administrative stuff, especially for for leadership. Um, a lot more mandatory classes that you had to take in order to sort of meet the different compliance standards and things of that nature. But no, it's at the end of the day, we, the mission stayed the same. And that was, you know, build amazing developer focused products that you know, allow people to communicate globally. Yeah, absolutely. And Twilio is like one of those just amazing companies that, that seems to have kept that culture for a really long time, always known for great developer experience and education and, and, and just great products as well. So I'm, I'm sure it's fun to, to see through that. But anyway, I interrupted you go back to, to propel. So 2021, you leave Twilio. Uh, did you jump right into propel or did you take some time off and, and what did that look like? I tried to take a grand total of two weeks off, um, which didn't really work. Um, you know, I'd said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to unplug for two weeks, but was excited about, about starting propel with my co-founder Nico and, you know, just, you just kind of end up doing things, right? Like you can't stop thinking. So I, I didn't really take any time off between that seven and a half years and jumping straight into Propel. Um, just went right after it, uh, was invigorated by the opportunity. It was, it was essentially building on something that we'd already built at, at Twilio and there was no platform for it. So we really wished, we, we essentially built the platform we wish we had when we were building the whole uh, client and voice insights product. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me about, yeah, what, what is Propel and what is, what is that product you had at, at Twilio and you sort of wanted to bring to the masses? Yeah, so I think if I, if I start with what is Propel and I'll go backwards. So Propel is a platform for developers, product engineers to deliver uh, customer-facing analytics or analytics of, of any nature quickly and efficiently. And it encompasses everything that you need on the back end from the whole data storage to the uh, you know the fast uh, you know query response times, all the way to the front end from the React components that you need to deliver the visualizations and everything in between there. And so when we built that at Twilio, we built that specifically for a product which we'll call you know which was called Voice Insights. Um, long story short, we had a lot of data that was coming off of our Kafka pipeline. That was originally being landed in S3 and then somehow making it, you know, making its way into Redshift. We could answer some questions that way internally, but needed a platform that would evolve that we could eventually turn into, a, a, you know, a, a customer-facing application. Graduated that data from S3 into Elasticsearch. Started using Elasticsearch and Kibana uh, to answer a lot of the questions. Uh, you know, we would provide Kibana graphs to customer support so they could actually turn those around and give those to customers. And then came the idea of like, let's just short circuit this and let's empower our customers with all this data. And so then we started building all of the pieces on top of that that you need in order to deliver a customer-facing solution. Yep, and, and customer-facing, 
Yeah, being huge. Like you mentioned Redshift, and I know like Snowflake and and uh, Databricks or QuickHouse have been big lately. Why, like, why not just expose your your Redshift or your your Snowflake, you know, behind some sort of API to your customers? What's wrong with that uh, sort of setup? Let's see, Redshift. Oh gosh, that would have been very scary to do. Um, right. <laughs> I definitely wouldn't have done that. Um, yeah. Like, let's just let's just leave that one alone. We'll just skip that. Like that was like back then, especially like that was that would have been you know. When it was like five queries at a time. and Yeah, it, the, the, the concurrency was terrible. It's not going to scale for you well. Like, I mean, that was always like one of those things, like you run a query, then you go away, get a cup of coffee, come back and hope it finishes, right? And you, you, can't, you can't deliver a, a customer-facing application um, <laughs> like that. That's not going to work. And then if you go to Snowflake, I mean, those early days, we didn't have Snowflake at, at Twilio. Um, we were not utilizing it. Those were probably very early days for it. And even today... If I wanted to build a customer-facing application with high concurrency and everything else like that, one, there's you're not going to get the concurrency you need. To get the performance you need, that's going to cost you an arm and a leg to keep those instances running all the time. Um, I mean, the whole reason for, for Snowflake is that separation of compute and storage. So when you're not running queries against it, you can spend the expensive storage down and keep the cheap compute. Well, if you've got a customer-facing app, you never know when somebody's going to hit that. So you've got to keep that up and running all the time. So, you know, that's print, that's costing you a ton of money. And then there is no real API other than, you know, a JDBC connection on top of Snowflake today. That doesn't exist. Um, actually, at the Snowflake Summit, uh, they were running a, a class on how to create a Flask app on top of, you know, a Flask app with a REST API on top of Snowflake and all the things you have to do, do for that. Yeah. That just like routes routes through it. Yeah, just routes through it. I mean, it was a very like, you know, uh, hugely attended. I mean, there's a ton of people attending that class because it doesn't exist. And if you want to build off that Snowflake data, you know, you, you, you just can't, you can't do it. And so for us going back to, to Twilio, you know, we had spun up Elasticsearch first because we, we were struggling trying to answer questions efficiently using Redshift. We started putting all that data into Elasticsearch indexes. And now we were getting the speed uh, that we wanted, and we were getting the whole front end through Kibana so we could actually visualize everything. Um, and then at that point, it was like, well, we're using this already. This works. What if we put in, like, what if we continue to use the API on top of this? Because they did offer that, but then build out the middleware and then essentially build that into the the console, the Twilio console, uh, in the form of, of visualizations like, you know, all your you know, you know, your, your time series and everything else like that. So you could actually see what was happening with the call. Yeah. Very cool. And so when you, you sort of mentioned customer support, having access to that Elasticsearch Kibana, when you rolled that out to more customer facing, like actually end users, was that still Elasticsearch behind the scenes doing that? Or did that architecture then switch? Well, we couldn't. So like to, to go to the first part, so we couldn't actually give customer support access. Like some of them Maybe later on that we're a little more advanced, we would allow them access to that Kibana interface. But typically what would happen was support would, would go to Slack and say, hey, here's a call SID that's that was reporting issues. Here's the customer. Can you tell me what happened? And then we would take that and you know go through a series of steps to figure out, okay, what's happening? Start ask, asking questions, get a visualization to turn back and say, hey, you know, we could do we could do as much as say, okay, for this particular call we could see in this leg here, all of a sudden the CPU started spinning up really, really high and the call, and there was a whole bunch of jitter. The call quality dropped and then eventually the call just dropped off. And we could return that in the form of a graph or at least tell that story, give it back to customer support who could then go to the end customer and say, here's what happened. Obviously that becomes very expensive as you, as you scale and get larger and larger. And so I think at one point we had calculated like each customer support ticket was like thirty five dollars. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because you basically have a, a you need a data analyst on demand as well and as well as all that infra and, and yeah and someone that can be sharp and think about that stuff. Yeah. And we tried to put as much tooling as we could around there. Like we we wrote some Slack bots to like where they could drop in a call sit and would automatically run a bunch of sort of basic analysis and things like that and then make it more self service internally. And then that was, you know, that was largely when it was like, well, can we build this for customers? And when it was time to build it for customers, we kept the same data in Elasticsearch and continued to use Elasticsearch for both internal and external. Um, and then we just essentially built a middleware tier on top of that that would broker the inbound, you know, REST requests from the console to Elasticsearch and back. And then pride of all, all the access control and everything else like that. Yeah. How big was that Elastic cluster? Are you, are you allowed to say? 
I have notes more. I, I can definitely say it's just more. Can I remember? Um, I mean, it was, it was in the terabytes of data and it was probably, I don't know, at least like eight to 10 nodes. Yep. Okay. Well, I would have, I would have expected bigger than that. If I sort of customer facing step, maybe larger. Uh, yeah, yeah it might've yep. been larger. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think that was, it, it was, it was, it, it cost us a considerable amount of money a year, put it that way. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you know, we had five people, it took me five people to staff a team in the beginning, uh, to build that entire application that the whole customer facing stuff. And so it definitely was not a cheap endeavor. Um, and then the biggest problem was all the other product lines inside of Twilio wanted that same thing. Um, and so it was, you know, we couldn't support it on you know, what we were running because we, like I said, we're generating a ton of data already. And it was folks inside of my team having to manage that, keep it operational. Um, and then somebody like, you know, the chat team comes along. And it's like, hey, can we start filling up indexes? And it's like, no, um, you, you, you got to spin up your own. And then it's, you know, the messaging team is like, hey, can we, no, you need to, so each, all of these, you know, inside of each kind of like organization end up having to staff their own like mini data engineering teams and, you know, spin up a Elasticsearch instance and, and run all this stuff and kind of follow the same blueprint we had. But, you know, that, that's when we started thinking like, why is this not a platform? This, this needs to exist as a platform. This, this seems like a pretty common problem. Yep. Yep. Also just going back to, you know, we talked about why not Redshift or Snowflake? Why not, you know, if I have a, a Postgres instance that's, that's handling this particular feature or thing, why can't I just run these sort of queries and show that to my customers, you know, run against my, my Postgres or my SQL or whatever, whatever sort of transactional store I'm using? Sure. I mean, I, I think if you if you enjoy uh, getting paged and uh, for incidents and pager duty and everything else like that, I mean, originally there were there were products inside of Twilio that did exactly that, and so you know we would have our transactional databases running. Um, you know, these are all you know highly uh, you know normalized that are that are you know optimized for rights and transactions, and somebody would come in and say, hey, you know what, I've got to I've got to get some analytics out of this. And so the first thing they would do is they would start querying that. And then some query would get awry and, and would lock up a table. And then the, you know, the, the use case that it was designed for would no longer work. And then we'd have an outage and then we'd all get paged and we'd come in and figure, you know, forensically figure out what is going on and, oh, who ran this query? Oh, that's from, you know, that's from the reporting side of the house. Shoot, why are we doing that? Okay, let's do read replicas. <laughs> and, then, and then you kind of graduate to that. And then, then it just becomes... We actually need to separate this. Like, we actually need to separate these these two use cases. And, you know, yeah, that's when we started sending things to, to Redshift or, you know, obviously in the case of what we were building, we weren't using a lot of databases. So our data was essentially our services were generating events that were going on to a Kafka pipeline. And then that was making their way into Elasticsearch. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's like there's like this middle ground where you know the the strict OLTP stuff that's handled really well by Postgres MySQL all all sorts of flavors of database and then the strict OAP reporting stuff is handled well by Redshift and Snowflake but that middle tier where it's like I want to be doing aggregations and flexible queries and things like that but it's it's going to be at a higher volume it's going to be exposed to my customers and that thing like that's a uh, that's a harder problem to solve and I've seen that uh, be difficult for a lot of folks so I guess like what what's the approach at Paprel how does What's going on there? That's where we wish we had ClickHouse. And if we'd had ClickHouse at that time, I think things would have been, that probably would have been the technical choice we would have made. How oh, interesting. Um, yeah. But coming out, of, coming out of Twilio, going into the early design phase of, of Propel, it was like, I don't want to run Elasticsearch again. Yeah. Like, no I don't want to be responsible for spinning up this you know, this giant cluster of nodes and, and the type of problems that we had, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense for what we want to do if we want to platformize this and, and have it be multi-tenant and everything else like that. And so this is where ClickHouse came in. Yeah. I, I Just to interrupt you, I feel like I feel like that's the feeling of like everyone that's done that. They're like, you know, I'll, I'll stick with it while it's here. But like the next time this sort of comes up that someone suggests this, it's like, please, can we just use anything else? Because it's, it's operationally like, it's very difficult. It's amazing and powerful, you know, in a lot of ways, but it's also like operationally, it's, it's a difficult beast and, you know, try to avoid it or limit it as much as you can. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because it's like all the things you're hitting on are unfortunately things that I've, I've done and, and have, have cut my teeth on and, and hurt myself at other places. Um, I tried the whole, we tried the whole Postgres thing. We did that at, at Skype. 
um, we would we would regularly knock over. Heroku had a hosted Postgres, and we would destroy that thing with the amount of data that we were sending to it. Um, so uh, we would have to get on the call with like the CTO of Heroku and like, hey, sorry, we did it again. <laughs> they would have to try to recover it for us. We'd only be able to recover a certain amount. And then, you know, a few days would go by and we'd kill it again. And they were angry at us. And so it was like, yeah, don't, don't do this type of, of workload on Postgres. And then obviously at Twilio was the, okay, we're doing this on Elasticsearch. And now at Propel, we're doing all this on ClickHouse. Yeah, that, that's amazing. I just I just uh, interviewed Craig Kirstein from, you know, Heroku Postgres for a long time. I wish I would have known that story. I could have asked him, hey, what do you think about what do you think about Tyler Wells and the Skype team uh, and their Postgres usage? I'm sure you would have loved that one. Yeah, we were. It, it, it's a, it was a kind of interesting story. We when I was at Skype um, had built the uh, the Facebook video calling that was all powered by Skype. And we had we had shipped well, we'd we'd, we'd launched it and. You know, day one, we launched it to like 13 million Facebook users. And they had it sort of like geographic specific on where they were going to allow it. Of course, the way that they'd done it um, didn't quite hold up and people were figuring out how to game it. And so all of a sudden we went from like 13 million to say like 15 million. Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the sort of like caveats of of the deal was we had to, we had to hit a certain like call completion percentage or something like that. So if somebody, hey, attempted to make a call, it had to complete, I don't know, like 95% of the time or something like that. And so we had to generate CDRs, which are kind of like a very SIP type world, um, you know, call data records. But we had to have some place to shove those CDRs so we could actually calculate the call, you know, the, the call completion percentages. And um, we couldn't shove those in, into the, the back end of, of Skype um, they were like, no way, uh, you know, that would have taken a long time. And so that's where we ended up spinning up Heroku. So it was like, okay, we got out the company credit card, you know, paid the money for self, you know, for, for hosted instances of Heroku and, and a couple of other things and started jamming all that data in there. Well, all of a sudden you go from, you know, 13 million to 25 million to a hundred million. And you can imagine all the CDRs you're generating, um, you know, the billions upon billions of rows. And then finally, it's just, that thing would just fall over. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, um, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, we finally got to the point where we would just have a cron job that was just going in and just all it did to delete rows. It just deleted rows constantly. And then we had to introduce sampling because even doing that, we couldn't keep up with it. Um, especially as that got opened up to, you know, the 750 million Facebook users that were there at the time. And as they were nearing a billion. Yeah. That's wild. What a fun story. Yeah. So, okay. So sounds like you've sort of graduated to, to ClickHouse at Propel. Tell me, uh, yeah. Tell me what that looks like sort of under the hood. Yeah. So under the hood, um, first thing we did is kind of did a steel thread and we were like, okay, what's the performance of this at a billion rows? And so we wrote a very, I would say rudimentary API in running in the a Lambda function. Um, it was written in, in like Node.js or something like that. And it could connect to ClickHouse that we, at the time we were just running a ClickHouse, like on an, on an EC2 instance, um, probably underpowered or whatever else like that. And, you know, we created a synthetic data set that had over a billion rows and it was like, Hey, can we get the performance we want of this? And that was like sub second. We want sub second performance over a billion rows doing a bunch of dynamic aggregations and everything else like that. And obviously you know, ClickHouse, it was like, yeah, no problem. That's, that's, uh, that's a piece of cake. And so from there, it was like, okay, so now let's actually build this thing. So we'd proved ourselves that the things we want to do are going to make sense from what we want, you know, the platform we want to create a Propel. Let's go make it real now. And so it was like, okay, how do we want to do this? We, we had, at Twilio, had done a bunch of things. Um, we're just, you know, standalone EC2 instances. You have to spin a lot of that stuff up by hand, or you've got to build a, you know, a lot of kind of supporting infrastructure to handle deployments and, and everything else like that. And we're like, you know, let's do Kubernetes. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of, of cool stuff around, you know, tooling around Kubernetes. Let's use that. Um, let's, let's stand up EKS. Uh, let's use the ClickHouse operator and, and, and go with that. And, and that's how we're running it today. And so, you know, we're running a pretty, a pretty decently sized cluster uh, we've got three replicas, um, you know, running at all time. Uh, it's sitting inside of, our production environment under AWS EKS. Um, we use uh, CDK for all of the deployments, as well as the application of those either Helm charts and or manifests to 
um, you know, uh, manage the infrastructure. And um, yeah, it's been running now uh, quite well for us for a couple of years. I've been real, real happy with that. It's been very stable and fast. Gotcha. And so for, are you running separate ClickHouse instances for each one of your customers? Or are you running ClickHouse sort of multi-tenant? I don't know how ClickHouse works uh, on that aspect. So we're doing multi-tenant. So ClickHouse is, is designed as a, as a single tenancy, but we're kind of giving each customer their own database and then using the access control policies inside of ClickHouse to ensure that, you know, customer A only ever sees customer A's data and that's it. And so we've turned it in, we've, we've made it multi-tenant and we built all the security and, and sort of the safeguards to ensure it's multi-tenant. But we've also evolved now. So originally it was like, hey, we're going to have this serverless multi-tenant thing that um, you know, we'll run this giant cluster and, and maintain it and ensure the performance and everything else like that. But we're now starting to evolve to where, yes, you still have the serverless, but a customer can come to us and say, hey, I want to have single tenancy. I want to have my own virtual instance run that for me, give me all the same things that Propel has, but then now separate that from you know, the, the multi-tenant solution. So I've got a little more control over performance and don't have noisy neighbor problems and, or potentially have noisy neighbor problems and, and stuff like that. Yep. Gotcha. And when they do that, is that still entirely within Propel's AWS account or is that like, you know, partially in someone else's account, but you manage it for them? Like what's, I, we, I've seen a few like different hosting models for new data infrastructure. Like what are you seeing? What are y'all doing there? Today it's hundred percent in our AWS account. Okay. And so we have everything hosted in US East 2. Um, all that data stays inside of US East 2, and we manage all of that infrastructure on behalf of our customers. Gotcha. Is that in the same Kubernetes cluster, but just like sort of different different pods and things like that if someone wants their own virtual? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, correct. So we have a set of uh, pods in their own namespace uh, today that's all the serverless. And then if a customer comes in, we'll spin up a new set of pods um, in their own namespace and, and keep it there. Gotcha. And I'm just like not as familiar with ClickHouse and, and what's going on in the scene there. I, I know it's at least columnar. I guess I can you can you describe to me a little bit on like how how ClickHouse is working so well? Because I've seen a lot of people talking about how, you know, how well it works for these sorts of, of use cases. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a columnar data store. So it's going to be insanely fast. Uh, specifically, you know, we we do most everything with with time series data. And so when people are bringing us that data, um, you know, it's either going to be doing kind of append only data where they're just constantly adding to it. So it's like, you know, they've got events that are taking place and these events are not mutating. And so we're going to create uh, a data pool for them in, in that nature. They're going to say, Hey, here's the, here's the timestamp that I want to use. Here's the column. That's the timestamp that I want to use. That allows us to do all the ordering and, and clustering of everything that way. And, and set and then ClickHouse takes care of the partitioning and everything like that for us. And then makes all those sort of on-the-fly dynamic aggregations extremely quick. Or a customer can come to us. We also have the ability to do updating data pools as well. And so if you are mutating records inside of that and inside of that data set, um, you know, we'll use a um, replacing merge tree for that. And that'll allow us to, hey, I've this data is 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 um, we need to mutate it sometimes. Things are gonna happen on our back end, maybe we're running state machines or things like that. And I've got a single record that's going to mutate through states. Um, we'll pick all of those changes up and then apply those to that uh, to that data pool as well. Gotcha. And what are sort of the trade offs on if I have more of like an update style workflow versus you know an insert only, append only type workflow? Or am I going to see um, like lower, lower latency or I guess higher latency on that update only workflow, or just like some delay in, in getting those? Or like, what does that look like? I know that's difficult for sort of warehouse type type things generally. For warehouse type, yeah, I mean, I think for from what we've experienced so far, it's it's been minimal. Um, I would say it's it's been. I'm not going to quantify it very well right now, but it, it it hasn't been enough to 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 sort of like, you know, make me, uh, you know, make me stay up at night going like, oh crap, is this thing going to work or not? Right. So, all of our testing and everything else like that, and our customers that are in production utilizing it today, I'm not. We're not seeing. We're not seeing any sort of latent issues that we're, we didn't expect things are things are working as as expected gotcha and is there like a sweet spot for propel customers of, of like amount of data or 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 different things like that for like hey this is when this this really shines for you and either bigger is too hard or like smaller is like something else might be more effective for you or what sort of target customer 
for you in that sense? Yeah, I mean, we we do all of our benchmarking at a billion rows plus, a uh, billion to 10 billion rows. And we have data sets that, that we keep around that so when we're running through all of our unit testing and everything else like that, that we can utilize those those larger data sets. I feel like where we can shine is you're starting to get in that 100 million row plus, um, you know, category. Um there's things that we can do there that are that are really going to make that data set snappy, that are going to continue to ensure that you've got that, you know, sub-second response time. Um, whether you're running, you know, a simple count, whether you're running uh, any sort of, uh, you know, time series type aggregations and things of like that. I mean, that's all just going to be very snappy and responsive. And so your customer's customer um, or our customer's customer, they're going to be able to, you know, experience kind of near real-time data analytics um, you know, inside of their, uh, inside of the console or whatever they're, tr- they're trying to build for. Okay. So tell me, you all have like a pretty serverless billing model, which is, which is interesting to me and like kind of surprising. I think, I feel like a lot of data places still have trouble with that sort of thing. So you're paying per gig of storage, you're paying per like basically gig of, of data scan during a query type operation. Like w- was that a difficult thing to pull off? Has it been um, have you had to adjust or re-level that or has that worked pretty well? Like, how did you sort of go through that process? Well, first and foremost, having dealt with a number of other, I would say, like embedded analytics solutions and, and things of that nature that we're trying, that they have seat-based licenses. Um, you know, how do you, how do you deliver a solution like this with a seat-based license? That's very hard. So if I want to build on my data and it's like, well, how many seats do I have? No idea. <laughs> Am I going to buy one per customer? Am I going to take one seat and kind of hack my way through it? Like we felt that that just never worked. And so, you know, we took our experience at Twilio where everything was usage-based and we said, okay, how are we going to apply usage-based billing model, um, you know, to this type of analytics? And we broke it down and like, what are the things that we have to pay for um, that you should have to pay for as well? And that's, that's storage because we're providing value on top of just like, it's not just sitting in S3 or it's not just sitting on an SSD. You get a whole lot more value out of that data that's there. Um, and that's something we have to keep up and running at all times. And then what's the next piece that, you know, that we is providing value and that's the compute because the compute is providing you that low latency. And so it was very easy for us to look at how long did, and ClickHouse makes it simple as well, because ClickHouse is going to give you statistics in terms of how many rows did it scan, how much data was that, how long did it take, and everything else like that. That just becomes an event in our system that goes on the bus, and then we use it for billing later on. Has that been hard to, like, I mean, are people receptive to usage-based billing? I mean, in some sense, you see a lot of this with, like, certain serverless services, but then also people, you know, in some sense have been used to paying for instances and, and just thinking about that and having more predictability out of it. Like what, what's been the, the reaction to, you know, having a fully usage-based billing model? I'd say it's 50, it's 50, 50. Um, some people that have come from like the Snowflake model or have used Snowflake before where it's very usage-based understand it very well. Others start to do this crazy sort of mental calculus where they're, ex- they're, taking these absolute worst case scenarios and then multiplying your your cost per, you know, gigabyte queried or, you know, storage and everything else like that. Because everybody at first goes to, oh, I'm, I'm definitely going to have a terabyte and I'm going to serve millions of queries. And, it, it, you know, at least to date, um, that's not been true. But they kind of go through that and it immediately starts to freak them out. And they're like, that's going to be way too expensive. Um, and that's, that's hurt us at times. And so, you know, people have sort of extrapolated out these worst case scenarios or best case in some, you know, however you want to look at it. And they're like, oh, that just costs us way too much money. We can never do it. And it's like, but if you're serving that same level of traffic and you're running it yourself, let's talk about the number of engineers you're going to need to run that. Let's talk about your infrastructure that you need to run that. You're going to be paying probably 10 X, um, than what it would cost to go and propel. Um, and you know, if you've been there and you've done that, you're like, okay, I get it. Like, I understand it's, it's also, if you start to get to those levels of, you know, I'm doing millions of queries, you're probably not going to be playing rack rate either. Like we didn't, when we were at AWS and use them, you know, you start to have those negotiations. We start to put together sort of like tiered schedules and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's kind of been 50, 50, if you're used to buying instances, it throws you off a little bit. And so that's why we've actually just um, last week started redoing our entire price model. Um, we've also made some internal, uh, some changes in terms of how we store data that have given us a lot of efficiency. So we dropped our 
our storage price from 250 a gigabyte down to I think we're at 30 cents a gigabyte. Wow. Yeah, I saw 30 cents. Wow, that's a that's a big drop there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge drop. And then we started we're starting to introduce pricing now for those uh, dedicated virtual instances. And so we're starting to put that in. I think that's running, you know, for like a medium type instance is like, you know, like a dollar, dollar 30 an hour or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Um, and then, so that way, you know, if you understand the pricing model of usage of, of, Hey, I want to be serverless. I'm going to pay for storage. I'm going to pay for uh, gigabytes process per query. You can take that route. If it's like, no, I, I want my dedicated, I understand, uh, buying instances. You can take that route now as well. Yeah. Um, with a lot of different data products over the last, I would say, you know, six, seven, eight years, we've seen S3 become like a key part of that. Is that something that factors into your product or your roadmap in terms of maybe like data tiering type things? Or is it just like, hey, we're a low latency provider and like we have to be on, you know, SSDs and rather than, you know, taking that that hit from pulling cold stuff from S3 or how, how do you think about that? It'll become a combination where it's already become a combination of both, right? So S3 is obviously cheap storage. Um, customers aren't accessing all the data all the time. So you want to be able to have hot tiers and you want to be able to have some things that are more available or obviously use smart caching. And so we'll have a combination of that. So we've started to move towards a more S3-based model. Um, if you look at like ClickHouse Cloud, they have a whole write-up of you know all of their stuff is, is S3, then they use caching. Um, our first versions of all this stuff were, were basically SSDs, and that just gives us the, you know, the, the crazy, insane performance. But then you've got to deal with how do I scale that infrastructure? How do I, what do I do if, okay, I've deployed my infrastructure with this many terabytes of SSDs attached. Somebody comes in and immediately starts to exceed that. What do I have got to do? So obviously we have things that are monitoring and everything else in place that then start to spin up and attach a different you know, additional SSDs. But if you take the S3 approach, it's it's unlimited storage, right? And so I feel like long-term, that's the way people will go. Um, and then you just be, you become smart about how you're going to tier that data or cache that data. Yep, yep, absolutely. Another thing I like to talk about with sort of data infra, infra type people, think about underlying costs is, is sort of cross AZ network costs, which is something I see come up a lot. Is that like a big factor for you all? Like, you know, doing, I think you mentioned three replicas for this. Do you have a lot of like cross AZ traffic? Is that a meaningful cost for you? Or is that sort of overrated, overblown in terms of what it looks like? Right now, overrated, overblown. We're not seeing it. So yes, I've got three replicas. They're deployed in three different AZs inside of the same region. So inside of US East 2. Um, that doesn't even, when I look at that AWS bill, which I look at a ton, <laughs> spent a lot of time there. It, it's not even, it doesn't even factor in. Um my compute costs are, are sort of number one. My storage costs are, are number two. Um, you you know you got to get start to get things like Dynamo and, and everything else in there. Uh, surprisingly, at one point our our NAT gateways were very very expensive. Um, we've since done away with the majority of those um, and eliminated a lot of that cost. But no, the the, the cross AZ traffic I just don't even see it right now. Yeah, is it tough to have this? Um you know, infrastructure product and you're, you're much more than just like a reseller seller of AWS. Cause you're adding like, you know, significant value add on top of those, those things. But is it tough to like manage that, you know, there's that, that core underlying infrastructure cost, and how do you sort of build that out to, to customers and go through that, that sort of like, how did you go through that? Did you talk with other infra providers? Like what did that process look like? Yeah. I mean, I think in, in the beginning we did a cost model, right? So we, we looked at, what does all of the underlying infrastructure cost for us to keep this thing up and running with, you know, kind of hypothetical this many number of customers and hypothetical this much data stored on us? Um, and what makes sense for us to kind of break that down to, you know, not be insanely greedy in, in, in terms of your margins there, but, you know, something that's, that's, that's reasonable. Um, and then obviously you start to look at some of the the people that are playing in the same space. I think one thing that was hard was finding people that were doing what we were doing at the time. Um, ClickHouse Cloud wasn't out yet. Um, there's a company called Tiny Bird that was is doing I think similar things. Um, CubeJS was was different, um, and so. We kind of had to take a, a you know a swag and said, okay, here what what makes sense? Um, what makes sense on on what we are spending, um, and then the value that we're adding. And the way that we looked at a lot of that value was, 
how much would it cost for a company to do this themselves? And how many engineers would it take to maintain this and manage this? Because this was like the, the, the same sort of infrastructure play that we would have taken if, say, for instance, I had to build this again at another company and then factored all that in. Yep, absolutely. What about in terms of, uh, you mentioned compute being your highest cost. I remember talking to a friend at Datadog and talking about how their, their compute ran a pretty low utilization because they just need to be ready for you know, a customer query that comes in and spikes that super quickly. Like, do you have to run your compute pretty low um, just to account for like, you know, these huge queries that can, that can spike through that? Yeah, hundred um, percent. Obviously I use reserved instances to, to, to help offset some of that, but yeah, we don't, we're a platform, right. And, and available 24 um, seven. Our customers are building their analytic use cases for their customers on top of us. We have no idea when they're going to hit us. We have no idea how often they're going to hit us. They, we have to be available 24 seven with, you know, I'd love to say five nines. We're probably not quite there yet, but we're, we're, we're pretty close to that. And so, yeah, we've, we've got instances of specifically on the data tier um, that are relatively low utilization. And, you know, they have periods where it's like, okay, it's getting there. We're getting a lot of traffic and then periods where it's just absolutely nothing. Um, but I think, you know, that's pretty common. We used to see a lot of similar type patterns, uh, specific, you know, at, at Twilio. Um, and there's some things you can do with that, but, um, you know, for the time being, I think we just kind of got to eat that and, and, you know, make sure that I would, I would rather focus on the availability and the responsiveness than try to do some trickery with, you know, auto scaling, especially when it comes to people's data. Right. Um, I would hate to, hate to have, would hate to have something where it's like, Oh, you know, we try to be smarter or, or clever, you know, with our utilization and I lost data. Like that's one thing is as a, as a data company, I never want to have happen is, is lose a customer's data. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that we have a ton of redundancy built in and, and ways that we can recover it through backups and replicas and everything else like that. But still like, you know, two huge fears as a, as a data company is I lose somebody's data or, you know, I have a data breach or, you know, customer A runs their queries and they see customer B's data. Like those would just be uh, horrible. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, okay. Let's shift back to the product a little bit in terms of getting data into Propel. It looks like, as I was sort of looking at it, it looks like I would say three main buckets of, of ways, right? One would be Snowflake directly. People hooking up their Snowflakes and you're just ingesting data there. Another one would be Webhook, right? Where I can just sort of send data to the Propel API. You'll ingest it and put it in. And the other one I would say is like, is, you know, like S3 Parquet, of which a bunch of things can sort of export to, whether that's Kinesis Firehose or different databases and things like that. Am I, am I, am I sort of understanding that correctly? 100% correct. Yep, that is it. So, yeah, the first one we built was Snowflake. Um, we really, really liked that ecosystem and uh, felt that was, at the time, uh, kind of a gold standard. Uh, still at the time, I mean, still is, the, you know, kind of gold standard of, of warehouses. And uh, we're very hopeful that a number of Snowflake customers would need that API that we provide at, at Propel, at GraphQL API to build applications. And so we wanted to make that sort of the standard. Um, and that allowed us to then venture into, hey, you know what, we should probably have a webhook. We should have S3. We should uh, be able to, you know, we do a lot of the stuff in, in Parquet format. That's sort of our native format uh, throughout Propel. And then we're starting to open it up to more things like, you know, see Kafka coming here shortly. We're almost done with that. Um, you know, and, and we've looked at things like Databricks. We've looked at things like BigQuery. Uh, we haven't seen as much sort of market demand for those. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially, that's that's how we can ingest that data. Yeah. Okay. And with the 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 S three Parquet is Parquet is something that ClickHouse speaks natively, or is it just easy for you to sort of suck that up and then ingest it into Parquet, or, or I guess why the Parquet choice? Yeah, ClickHouse speaks that natively. We have no issues with that, so we can ingest that very simply. Okay. Yeah, and efficiently too. So, like, we've had to do some work around that, but um, I feel like our Parquet support is 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 very strong. And so, we'll even take you know, if somebody's sending us JSON through webhooks, we convert all of that stuff, um, and then we were able to 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 slurp that into into ClickHouse uh, easily and efficiently. Gotcha. With those webhooks, do you do some sort of like batching and aggregation, and maybe upload every fifteen minutes or something like that, like with Kinesis Firehose, or are you taking those and and inserting them right away, or what, what are the, what's the web so? webhook story look like? Depending on the request per second, we will insert those straight away. Um, but we have the ability also to throttle those and slow it down a little bit. And then we'll use things like Kinesis in order to do the batching and everything else like that. 
And so, um, you know, I think we're probably doing, what are we at now? Uh, you know, 50, 50, 50 messages per second or something like that on the webhook connector, um, which today most of our customers are not exceeding. Um, you know, we can, we can obviously burst well beyond that, but we've kind of, we start to slow it down at about, at about 50. Okay. And so ClickHouse does pretty well with um, frequent small inserts. Like I'm from like the, again, like the redshift mindset of just like, hey, make sure you have batches of data and you're not just like writing the little tiny inserts. But ClickHouse does well with just sort of writing little tiny records in. Yeah, that was one of the really cool things. I mean, I remember if I go back again to my, my Skype days of why, you know, I was always interested, oh, let's do Hadoop. Like we can run all this. We've got like, you know, all the power of Hadoop and <clears throat> we can run all these MapReduce jobs and, and really make this more efficient, but when you're doing CDRs, those are all very small, you know, uh, small amounts of data coming in uh, frequently, and that was not going to work. You had to batch all that stuff up, and that's how we ended up in Postgres land. But ClickHouse has no issue with that. So you send us one or two records, fine. It's going to get in there, you know, quickly and easily. You start to send us thousands of records, or we're going to chunk that up, especially if it's coming from, like, Snowflake. We're going to break that into logical pieces because there is sort of a a limit of how much you can push through Snowflake at, at one time without knocking it over. And so we've experimented with all of that and tested all of that. And so, you know, our ingestion systems will pull that in, chunk it up appropriately, and then dump it into, into ClickHouse and make it available. Yeah, gotcha. What about um, straight streaming from transactional databases, whether it's like, you know, DynamoDB Streams or Mongo Oplog or, you know, Postgres and MySQL, sort of the replication log. I, are people looking at that or is this the type of data that, you know, is more like, like you're saying, the event type data that's going through Kafka, maybe just and then into Snowflake, but not sort of your core transactional data? So in the earlier days, I would say it was more of the analytical data. And so this would be like post DBT type data was sort of the first use case that we went to. So you've kind of built that universal table. You've done all of your joins. Um, you've enhanced that data, enriched that data. From a bunch of other tables, you've landed in Snowflake, and now you brought it into Propel, and now you've got all of that fast-serving layer. That's evolved into <clears throat> now multiple data sources coming in and then wanting to join that data, and it's evolving again until, hey, what if I've slapped Debezium on this, and now I've got Debezium you know, feeding CDC into Kafka, and now I want to land that into Propel? And I think at some point we'll see it also where those, those types of use cases bypass even a Kafka and go straight to Propel. Yeah. Okay. Do I have to, you sort of mentioned like the, um, joins ahead of time, some of the denormalization work, like, sh I guess, how does that ingest work? Is it just going to take it exactly as I come? Is it going to infer my columns? Should I do some transformations on it? Like in terms of like optimal querying from this, what should, what should that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this is the, uh, again, always evolving, right. As, as data and, and we talk to more people, um, the original thesis was our original thesis was people were utilizing, you know, they were using Postgres for transactional. They were transferring all of that data into something like, like Snowflake. And so uh, extracting it all, dumping it into Snowflake, taking something like DBT, running their jobs on top of that, landing that into that nice wide table. Then we could come in and, and slurp all of that up. That was like our happy path. Um, obviously when you get into the real world, you know, I've probably got two customers that actually do that <laughs> and you know, they're great. They're very easy. It's like, wow, this is a piece of cake. And you actually listen to us and some of our advice and, and you, you built those, those, uh, those, those pipes that way. And you know, that, that thing just runs and it's, and it's, you know, super available for them, but the real world doesn't operate like that. And so as we've learned more, we've had to evolve and we've had to say, Yes, why we would love for you to do that, you're probably not going to. So we are starting to give them, our, our customers, more control over being able to do all of the joins and some more of the sophisticated sort of cleaning of that data and, and or enriching that data into whether it's a new view or, you know, materialized view, something of that nature. Those are all things that we're having to now evolve to uh, because a shift that I think we're seeing is – if you think a lot of the data space today, you know, how many different pieces of infrastructure are people utilizing? So let's move beyond just the, hey, like I'm going to have to have in most scenarios a transactional database. So let's just say you've got a Postgres, um, a MySQL or a Mongo on that left side. And then now I've got to sort of build the rest of my infrastructure to do analytics, to do 
build applications and everything else like that. Today, a lot of that is a whole bunch of pieces of infrastructure, right? So you've got everything from, okay, I've got a Kafka pipeline. Sure, it can continue with that. I've got to do some transformation and some enrichment. I'm probably going to bring in DBT. Or if I'm going Snowflake, I'm probably going to send that to Snowflake. And then I'm going to use their dynamic tables. I'm going to create these materialized views. I'm going to, I'm going to probably have to bring in another piece of, of you know, data to sort. There's just there's a lot of cobbling of Lego pieces, right? And I think one of the trends we're kind of seeing is is people want to have potentially like that single solution Swiss Army knife of may, maybe I'm not at the the scale of Snowflake or I'm not at the scale of, of Databricks yet, or maybe do I even need to be, but I want to be able to do all of these things on top of my data at, a, at a, maybe a somewhat smaller scale, and I want to use that data to build applications on top of it. That's a lot of, of different skills and, and sort of components that you have to bring together. And so I think the trend that we're kind of seeing is where do they go when they want that in a single solution? And if they want that in a single solution, it, does it exist today? Maybe. Um, you know, are we marching very quickly towards that at Propel? We're trying to, because again, our customers are driving that. Our customers are saying like, I don't want to, I don't really want to use DPT. I don't really want to do this additional step. Why can't I send you my Kafka, my web, my, um, my web hooks and pull in data from maybe Parquet files and then do all of that joining and enrichment inside of Propel and then utilize your APIs and your front-end UI components to deliver that to my customers. Yep, absolutely. Does ClickHouse have materialized views natively? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can do some really cool things. Like you can do a materialized view of a, of a Postgres table um, inside of ClickHouse. So your ClickHouse is actually connecting to your Postgres, and then you're creating material, uh, materialized views um, you know, out of the CDC in that, in that Postgres. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, so, yeah, th- that's... Yeah, there's there's some very cool stuff and, and, and tricks inside of there that you can do uh, neat stuff with. Yeah, very cool. One one other thing I loved, uh, I'm just looking through is you know you have access policies and, and you know given that you know there'll be API keys and things like that locking it down, but specifically the multi-tenant access policy stuff, right? Where I'm exposing this to end users, of which I'm probably going to have a lot of, and their data is going to be intermingled together, and and basically just sort of native in Propel, I can set up these policies that say, hey, you can only you know, they're going to pass this parameter in and they can only query for that, that data that they pass in, right? So you're not, you know, like you were short of saying, you don't want customer A to see customer B's data. If I'm customer A, I don't want customer one seeing customer two's data, that sort of thing. And you make it a, a lot easier for that sort of thing. Yeah. So we don't use API keys in that case. We actually don't support them. We use uh, JOT tokens. And so in order to utilize the, the Propel API, the GraphQL API, you need to create a JOT token. And then one of the things you do to enforce that multi-tenancy is you can use custom claims inside of that JOT token to state what is your tenant ID, your, your sort of um, your column of tenancy. And so you can imagine if you've got an account ID, and so you're going to go create that JOT token with that account ID embedded, embedded and cryptographically signed inside of that JOT token. That's going to be passed to the back end. We're going to validate that. And then that tenant ID is now going to be used essentially. The best way to think about it, it's, it's stamped into that where clause at all times. And so your front-end developers don't ever have to worry about that. So they're not thinking to themselves, okay, gosh, i got to make sure that SQL query is, contains that where clause that I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that I'm ensuring that you know, the account ID is set and everything of that nature. It's just part of the token. And so when that gets to the back-end Propel infrastructure, that's enforced by us. And so, you know, we're ensuring when you're saying, you know, give me that, uh, you know, give me that count of revenue or that sum, sum of, sorry, the sum of, of, of revenue for a given month for customer ABCD, it's going to be customer ABCD and not customer somebody else that's inside of my, you know, inside of your, your tenancy. So, yeah, exactly. And that makes me think back to, you know, at Snowflake Summit, and you're saying like building an API on top of Snowflake, that's like another thing you need to think about is just like making sure in your Flask API or whatever's fronting it that you're always adding that where clause. And it's interesting, we're seeing some more like tenant aware tools like this. Like we, you know, we have Nile for post transactional Postgres now, which also is like a tenant aware solution. You all have like tenant awareness built into it. I think that's, uh, that's pretty cool and is going to help a lot of these like, you know, multi tenant SaaS solutions that, that folks have out here. Yeah, and those are all lessons obviously we took from Twilio where, you know, Twilio was a multi-tenant platform and you know, we were that way from from day one. 
And so as you know, as we were designing Propel, it's like okay, multi tenancy, top of the list. Like Scott's table stakes got to be there, um, and we got to make sure we do it right. So yeah, that was that was important for us. Cool. One thing I was thinking about as I was looking through this, you know, data pool is sort of like your storage uh, concept there. If I'm a tenant of yours, should I always just have all my data in one data pool or should I potentially have split data pools? Like given there's that multi-tenancy aspect, are there other reasons to split up into different data pools or how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it just comes down to use cases and kind of how you're modeling it on your own on your own back end for the time being. I mean, that will that is changing here very quickly to where you can start to bring in all your tables and then create kind of these derived views on top of that inside of, of Propel. Um, you know, today... It's going to be how are you how are you sort of doing that modeling in your back end and you're thinking about the use case that you're wanting to serve um, in your in your front end in your console or, or your your application, and so you know we have a you know some of our largest customers will have two or three data pools um, that are solving diff- that are just built for different use cases that don't necessarily contain the data the same data there may be some overlap there you know like the account IDs and things of that nature but they're built for different use cases that they're serving up inside of their analytics. Uh, their, their their applications. Okay, cool, super slick. All right, I want I want to close this out with some common questions we've started asking all of our guests here, sort of rapid fire, and and um, get your thoughts on them. So, there are six of them. First one is if you could master one skill that you don't have right now, what would it be? Go to market. Go to market. Nice. That's good. that's a good. That's a hard one, right? It, yes, you, it you is. Know, just being builders all the time and, and thinking, how do I, you know, connect the dot to that end customer? Yeah, hopefully I don't slow down the, the rapid fire here, but I mean, I think a lot of us coming from that builder background, that engineering background, especially having been in, in larger, more established companies, you're not thinking about the go-to-market. Um, and that's a, you know, that's that's definitely been a, a you know, a, a steep learning curve as, as you know, we're building coming out. Because like the whole notion, like if there's ever like the, the biggest fallacy of like build it and they will come, <laughs> like not a chance, right? Um yeah, I mean, sometimes that happens. You're lucky, but I, I mean, I think in this case, it's yeah, I would go to market. Yeah, very cool, great answer. Uh, what wastes the most time in your day? Waste the most time. Um, I don't know. I mean, as a founder, it's it's hard to say that anything is a waste um, because there's always yeah. I mean, there's there's everything you're doing is is you know for survival. So. Um, I don't know, sleep, (laughs) (laughs) um, you know, if I'm sleeping, I'm not necessarily working towards, uh, you know, getting, you know, making propel successful, but no, I mean, it's, it's really hard to say because like, I look at, like, I was thinking, okay, everybody probably says, we probably get a lot of like, oh, meetings. Well, I mean, as a founder, who else is going to take the meetings? I have to. Um, and those meetings are going to be everything from sales calls to marketing, to product design, to operate across the board. So yeah, maybe maybe sleep. Yep, that's a great one. Um, cool. So if you could invest in one company that's you know not Propel, ideally a private company, so you could actually you know it's actually harder to to invest in. What who would it be? What which company are you sort of bullish on? I mean, it's got to be OpenAI right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'd be hard not to. I mean, that's that's you know, a great or, answer. You know, yep. or maybe you know pick off one of the one of the smaller up and coming, but I mean, if you could get an open AI or Mistral or something, yeah, yeah, like a Mistral or somebody like that would be, would be, you know, you may be able to get in a little earlier. So you got to, you know, you got a little more percent ownership, but yeah, I mean, I think you'd have to go up in AI. I mean, they're just, it's just changing the world too much to, to not want to be there. Yep. Yep. Do you use chat GPT, open AI stuff quite a bit, a little bit? Like what, what's your sort of usage like? I would say daily. Um, I, I use it for just about everything. Um, I was building something the other day and I was having to convert from, oh gosh, what was I doing? Um, it was giving me like something in like these crazy metrics and I needed like, how do I take this and convert it so I can actually use a tape measure? Um, you know, how do I measure this, this metric value to a, you know, translate that to a tape measure? And it's, it's, you know, it was doing things like that. Um, you know, I've had it do everything from, Hey, I've got these three ingredients, uh, give me a recipe to, Hey, I really don't want to parse. I don't really want to write code to parse XML. Can you, <laughs> you know, give me that? Oh yeah, it's amazing. Or generates fake data. Like it's it's all kinds of like amazing stuff. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. Yeah, so we use it for all that stuff internally. Like on the, like the on the job stuff. Like we've we've got a bunch of prototyping that we've done for Propel to make 
some of the analytics more efficient for our customers and to help them to get to insights faster. But we haven't released it yet, so it's it's we're playing with it still, and I think you'll start to see it soon. Um, we actually had a really a really cool thing. One of our customers did is they wanted to offer conversational analytics um, on top of the data they have inside of Propel, and so he built a rag, um, or utilizing a rag that uh, you know he made this sort of like conversational insight, so people could could ask questions of the data in you know in English, natural language. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yep. All right. What what tool or technology could you not live without? Could I not live without? Um, there's too many of them. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's like a single a single tool. Um, gosh, I don't know. I don't know if I have a single one that I could not live without. I mean, you know, I, I guess. I mean, I, I just say my computer, right? I mean. Yeah, it'd be kind of hard to live without that. And if I, you know, if I take it down a step from there, you know, I could live without an IDE. I wouldn't be very happy about it, but, you know, um, you know, I kind of like having my IDEs for that stuff, but no, I mean, I just keep it simple. Yep, absolutely. What person influenced you the most in your career? Man, um, I don't know if I have a, a single person. Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely been a lot throughout my career. I'm, I'll go to my early career. I'll, I'll say early in my career as a, like a senior software engineer, kind of making my way from into the early leadership um, as like an early, early director. Yeah, it's probably more early director of engineering, um, stuff like that. There was a guy by the name of Paul Emery, uh, who was our VP of engineering that was just, I mean, he was amazing. Um, he got the tech side of things, but he got the empathy side of things as well. Um, and so he influenced a lot of my, my early leadership style, I would say. And was, was Paul at, at Twilio? No, uh, Paul was not. So Paul and I worked at a company called FaceTime Communications. Um, and it was not the FaceTime that became Apple FaceTime. Um, it was only the name that they bought from that company. Okay. They actually bought the name from that company? They actually bought the, yeah, they bought the trademark and the name from that company. Um, that actually helped keep the, the company. They, the, the company ended up turning into a... They renamed themselves to Actience, uh, Active Compliance. Um, and that was, yeah, Paul and I worked there. At the time, it was it was FaceTime Communications. Wow. Cool. Great answer. Uh, all right, last one. What is your probability that AI equals doom for the human race? Zero. Zero. You're, you're feeling good. I'm feeling good. You're, it's all upside from here. It's not going to... Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it just gets... It gets I think a lot of it gets overblown and I think that there's enough people that are thinking about the problem from that side of the house that it's just, it's not going to run away from us that, you know, um, we're going to, it could always happen, but I, I think it's close. It's very close to zero. That's, that's where I'm at too. But uh, it's fun to think about. I think it's just too much good, right? I think that just the efficiency gains you can get from it. Like, I mean, there's probably a million projects swirling around in my head that I would love to do more with it, but obviously running a company is is takes up a lot of time and having a family takes up a ton of time and but there's like it just makes my life easier with a, with a number of aspects and so um you know I, you know maybe I'm bought in too much cuz you know I'm too much of a technologist but I I can't say that there's I've ever stayed up at night thinking like oh my god AI is going to take over the world and we're all going to you know be hunted down by these like terminators or something like that. Yep. What about like, this is off script, but you know, since you, you're clearly like thinking about this stuff a little bit, um, in 10 years, do you think we'll have more or fewer software engineers? I don't see software engineers going away anytime soon. I don't think people's jobs are necessarily at stake today because I can't think of anything where I could punch in an idea I can't go to GPT today, punch in an idea, and have a fully deployed solution for that idea. Um, it's just not going to work. Um, probably going to get way too many hallucinations. And, and two, there's still today, like, you, you can't just say, deploy. And all of a sudden, magically, all of that infrastructure it conjured up is, is now up and running and, you know, you know pick your flavor of, of cloud providers. Like, that doesn't work. Um, will it get there? You know, Probably. But, you know, today, in, in the next decade, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think there'll still be plenty of, of roles here for people that 
Because not every, the AI doesn't solve everything, right? I mean, we've looked at what we're building at, at Propel, and every time we, we bring up AI, we look at LLMs, it's not going to increase our, our, our market share, right? It's not going to increase our TAM. Oh, all of a sudden I introduce this thing that like, oh, AI, we're using LLMs to do X. My TAM doesn't increase magically because of that. Um, my existing customers are able to do things possibly more efficiently, um, faster, in a more repeatable nature um, without having to know as much. But I don't see my TAM wildly expanding because I've all of a sudden introduced a bunch of functionality there. Yep, yep. That's that's right. I, you know, when when, when sort of ChatGPT first came out, and you know, first started playing with it last January, February, I was like, wow, this is this is going to replace me soon. And then, you know, the more you play with it, you're like, okay, it's it's super useful in a lot of ways. Like you were talking about earlier, it still needs a lot of gu- it still needs a lot of guidance. I think it needs a couple, you know, jump steps before it really starts uh, replacing people. I think it's going to open doors for for a lot of people and, and increase that. So um, but it's been fun to see. But I mean, I, but I think if like the other thing that I'm seeing that's kind of interesting is there's sort of a class of developers that don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. yeah. And they're like very anti GPT and they're like, screw that thing. I don't want anything to do with it. And, you know, I've been at this for like 25 years and there's things I don't want to write anymore. Like I don't want to remember how to do certain things. Right. And it's been great at that. Like, you know, having to just sitting down and saying, Oh, I don't want to write this again. God, I've done this. I mean, how many times? And like, okay, now I'm now I'm not doing it in this language, but I'm doing it in this language over here. Let's just go have it do it. And then I just have it do it. And I can obviously you can read it, look at it, and be like, well, okay, that's pretty close. That's close enough. Okay, I can take it from here and, and just write the rest of it. Um, and I think those efficiency gains, at least for me, when it comes to just development, have been been really really cool. Um, I did use it for one thing that I thought was pretty fun the other day. Um, was how do you mint a JWT token? Um, you know, how do you how do you pick your language of choice and and how do you create a JWT token? Because that's kind of the first thing that a developer has to do when using the Propel API. Um, and we kind of had similar issues, I would say, back at Twilio because on the Twilio client we use JWT tokens as well for authentication. And I was like, you know, we should just have code examples in a whole bunch of different languages of how to just mint a token. And so I started with, obviously, like, started with, like, simple, did Python, did Ruby. Then I was like, well, let's do JavaScript. Let's do TypeScript. Well, hey, let's do C Sharp. Um, let's do Rust. And so next thing I know, like, over, I was like, it was like over a weekend, um, you know, utilizing, uh, you know, GPT and what I wanted to, to do and, like, refining my prompt every time I would, you know, some things were kind of getting a little, little screwy. And so I kept refining my prompt. Um, and I would get to the point where I was like, okay, this was now spitting out, you know, working code, um, that, you know, would generate this JWT token and then have, it was fully testable as well. So it would also generate all the unit tests and everything else like that. And, you know, now I have all that stuff is, is, you know, available in our open source on, on Propel uh, and GitHub and, you know, customer can go look at that. And it was like, yeah, this is kind of cool. This, this, this saved me a lot of time. Yep. Yep. And it's like, you know, you could have probably done all those. It would have taken a lot of mental energy, especially for the languages you don't know as, as quite as well. But just like being able to to just, you know, really, really reduce the mental burden to the point where you're, like, you're checking it and making sure it's all right and tweaking it a little bit rather than doing that pure creation aspect of it um, for something that's kind of menial. Yeah, that's that's like a great use case. I love, I love doing that. It like I expand my applications and add these little things on that would seem kind of annoying or hard to do and and just like you know now it just lowers the the barrier of doing that sort of thing yeah i mean there's enough we've got to think about every day right and something like that is like you said i mean yeah i could probably sit down and do it and but you know what am i what, what value am i going to necessarily get out of it um you know i want this for my customers and, and i'd rather be efficient about doing it and you know learn on the prompting and kind of go from there so that's been pretty cool and are you using it all for um, for like any of your content or content generation? You know, not a ton. Although I did have something recently where you know the the fear of the blank page was just like so strong that I I went into uh, my IDE where I have Copilot set up and I put like just a little comment at the beginning like Hey, I'm writing this and in here like sort of the points I wanted to do and then I started writing and just to like complete some paragraphs and often I would 
I would change it, but it would at least be like, okay, that's sort of what I want to say, or, you know, I'd word it differently or things like that, but it just like helps with that. And then also if you have code examples in there, just being like, here's an example of, you know, retrieving a user uh, in this particular thing. And then it, it does it and you could tweak it a little bit, but again, just like getting some of that uh, stuff out of there. I found that, yeah, I found that pretty helpful. Uh, I might start doing more of that. Yeah, I do the same. I find that, uh, especially the blank page, um, getting over that hump or, you know, being able to refine what I have or kind of take different spins on it. Um, it's definitely been super efficient. And yeah, I, I, I like, it. yeah, it's like, I don't love the voice, but it, it helps like just, you know, keep the ball rolling. And it's like, okay, I would rewrite it in this way, but that's like the same sort of idea that I wanted to, to get across. Yeah. I've had it try to do a few intros for my, for my podcast. Um, and it's a bit too bombastic in, in sort of yeah, in, in, in its yep. languaging where you're just like, okay, I would never speak that way. <laughs> yep. I know. <laughs> like, Same no, I can't. That's, that's too much. You've gone, like I said, be enthusiastic, but that's like above, above enthusiastic. You've gone too far now. I got to pull it back. <laughs> yep. I know. It doesn't know how to, it doesn't know how to like, you know, just do like a nice genuine, you know, like a, I'm excited about this, but I'm not like, you know, exclamation points and way over the top and, and, and lots of, uh, you know, big adjectives and things yeah. like that. Yeah. I don't want the word fantastical used all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. Well, Tyler, this has been, this has been a lot of fun. I've, I've enjoyed having you as a guest and, um, you know, learn more about Propel and what's going on in the scenes there. Uh, as you mentioned, you have your own podcast, so maybe tell folks where they can find you, where they can find Data Chaos Podcast, Propel, um, all those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Data Chaos Podcast is on, um, you know, all the major platforms out there. Um, so obviously using Spotify Podcaster makes that super simple. So it's distributed across, uh, you know, the, the, the Googles, the, um, you know, uh, Apple Podcast and, and Spotify is kind of the main one uh, that's been you know, very easy from a distribution standpoint and, and I've enjoyed that a lot. Um, just, just starting the second season of that, I just actually put out my first episode of season two today. Um, had a repeat guest come back on, so that was a lot of fun. Um, talked a lot about AI and RAGs and, and Llama Index, so that was pretty neat. And then as far as finding Propel, um, it's www.propeldata.com. Uh, you can also find all the podcast episodes there as well and our blog and everything else that goes along with uh, Propel and, and the platform itself. Cool. Awesome. Well, we will link those in the show notes. And, and Tyra, thanks for taking the time today. It's been great. Alex, really appreciate it. I've had a lot of fun on this conversation. So uh, yeah, it's been good times. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.